Um, so I just wanted to talk through some considerations. Like I said, I'm going to be more practical today. So um, certainly there's some structural considerations that we need to think about. Um, there's some considerations in the production system and probably the big one that I've grown to understand is uh, the attitudinal and belief considerations. Uh, so, you know, why should we consider the considerations? I guess, you know, from a bio, at a biological level, in my opinion, we're morally obliged to think about getting it right for the soil, plant and the animal, and I cannot stress that enough. From a human welfare perspective, we also need to get it right for the consumer. Um, I have a very strong belief that we can absolutely do both. Um, we should also consider the considerations because we've got to build trust with the customer, right? Uh, we, we really need to get that message about key aspects, about where it came from, how it was produced and what it stands for. Uh, and so I'm going to go into uh, examples later. I'm going to talk more about uh, what we should be sort of thinking about changing to start with. So let's look at structure. I'm going to be a bit mean today. Uh, who's really good at problem solving? I need four people. And if you don't put your hand up, I'm going to pick. And generally it will be faces that I know, so Josephine. You can be one. Uh, Hamish, you're going to have a job, but that's later. Uh, Steve. Scott, I can see you're hiding down the back there. Uh, and Trisha. So, like I said, I was going to take a more practical approach. What I want you guys to do is have we fiddle around. We've got these four components to the jigsaw puzzle at the bottom here. Um, I'd like you to just make your way up here if you can. Uh, and I want you to put these together in the best way possible that you think that they should flow in regards to a virtuous cycle, I guess, of information within the egg sector. Yep, so you've got, so you've got stud breeders, you've got uh, commercial farmers, you've got lambs process, and you've got processes themselves. And when you put it together, uh, you will be able to see the information flow and what is important. Right. So all of you think about the current industry structure right now. Right. Awesome. So that, that, that's our current flow. Um, what, what do we think at the moment in that particular picture? So we've got our stud breeders, we've got our commercial farmers, we've got lambs being processed, we've got processes themselves, we've got flow of information moving there and back. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But what, what do we think what do we think is missing? That's right. So Hamish, I've got a piece of paper for you. Can you come and put that in place? So guys stay there. So where do we think that should be? Good work. It's exactly where it should be. Um, yep, yep. So I want everybody to keep that picture in their mind. Um, so if we're adding the market in, uh, imagine if we could have access to market information. Imagine it. We don't really have it right now. So what could that market information tell us? It could tell us about supply and demand. It could tell us about where is the added value opportunity emerging. Could anyone tell me what they think the added value opportunity might be at the moment? Could you tell me what a point of differentiation that a customer would like to see? That's one. That's awesome. That, that, that's one, but there's probably multitude more. What is consumer behaviour telling us? What do we know? What our consumer wants more of, less of? What do they want to see? What attributes of the product? We don't know anything is the long and the short of it. Um, so if we can address these structural issues uh, across the entire supply chain, uh, we can get this great insight into the modern day customer expectations, which is what we're missing right now. So it's only then 
that we, and this is what I believe, that we can meaningfully address what our production system considerations should look like. So, uh, anyone got any suggestions on what our major production considerations could be or should be? Genetics might be one. Management might be another. Environment. Online measurement. Because if we're going to know exactly what we need to do in regards to genetics, management, environment, we need some online measurement or we need measurement within our production system. We need traceability because a customer wants surety. They want food safety. They want to know that that product is the right thing that they should be consuming. And we have to be able to reward for that. The one thing that you have to be very careful about rewarding in production systems is you can get it very wrong. So you need to make sure that that reward reflects very, very clearly what you want the behaviour in those production systems. I'll go into an example of that a bit later. So, uh, if we manage to change the structure and align our production systems to consumer expectations, what's the one aspect of the system that's left that essentially can disrupt and stop us achieving what we would like to achieve? Any ideas? Attitude and belief. So, our biggest roadblock at the moment is our immunity to change. It's not my responsibility. Have you heard that come out of your mouth? I want more for doing nothing different. <laughs> Have you heard that one? I hear these all the time. And, you know, the one thing that I would say is we are all responsible for paving a better way for the sheep industry in the future. And honestly, this is not, you know, these statements of it's not my responsibility and I want more for doing nothing different are last century attitudes. And I cannot stress that enough. So what I wanted to do today was talk about uh, all the things that I've just had a discussion about and talk about the Mega Land Project and how we see the world a little bit differently and what we've been doing. So, um, our attitudes and beliefs. So, I look after the on-farm component of the Omega Land Program. There are 33 farmers in there currently, and some of the, these are some of the things that we have developed over time. Um, we started from scratch, so you know we believe that doing something differently for an altogether different result, uh, and so focus on breeding for both consumer and productivity goals is absolutely key. We have to be able to prove that there is something different about it and the customer needs to know what that difference is and they have to want it. Teamwork is absolutely key. You know, the, the industry structure has completely screwed us. So changing the way we work across the supply chain is absolutely crucial and it doesn't just apply to Omega Lamb, it has to apply to the whole sector. Uh, so we are a supply chain team we are not a series of individuals, and that's the way we view the world. So well-being, uh, it's well-being of all in the supply chain, and you know this is probably very close to my heart. I'm very passionate about making sure that the well-being of animal, human, and environment is looked after. Um, so we've got a concept that sits behind the scene that you know that what is better for the you is better for humans, and I will talk a little bit about that a bit later as well. Uh, so quality of the product is absolutely paramount and it comes above everything at all costs. So we don't, if there's a volume issue, that doesn't come, even come in. If we have to sacrifice volume, we will to make sure that quality because the customer wants the quality. And if we do not have the quality, they won't pay the difference. They won't pay anything more and there's no additional value. So, I wanted to talk about some of the considerations. I'm, I can't go through all of them because there's a lot. Um, but I wanted to talk about some of the considerations we've had sitting in behind the scenes. So, some of the genetic considerations, uh, so big one surrounds fat, um, as you'd be aware from most of the media that's been about it, um, out about it. So, fat, for all of you um, who will know this, this very, very well, uh, absolutely crucial for species existence. So ensuring that an animal has the ability to condition itself and nourish itself is core to the welfare of the population. So what do you think we've done in the sector? Well, Correct. So 
So I've got a lovely little graph here for you that will demonstrate that it is a welfare concern for us that we are negatively selecting against that. So this is body condition score up the y-axis and we've got Bioscan GR um, and I can thank Tricia for this graph down the back. Um, so you take, essentially if you take carcass fat out, you are pulling back body condition score in ewes. So that is a major issue. So if there was one message that I would love to get home today is we need to be making sure that fat is still remaining in the system. So not negatively selecting against fat would be a positive start. So the fat itself and white fat in general is a very key component to the genetic program uh, and it's absolutely vital. So you'd be aware you are shifting a little bit back country. Um, so her ability to be fit for purpose in hill country is paramount and one of the things that will help her do her job is having a layer of insulation. And so making sure that she can do that and do it genetically by herself is what we want. So other genetic considerations, uh, me being a geneticist, um, I, I certainly felt morally obliged to make sure that we weren't, weren't gonna get anything wrong for the animal. And so when we were looking at these new customer traits um, or consumer traits, and integrating them into the genetic program, the one thing I said to the team was, look, I'm not actually prepared to drop them into the genetic program until I really understand what the relationship with those traits, with the rest of the traits in the production system truly is. So there's an incredibly large investment that went in uh, to undertake and assess the relationships to get this right. Uh, so essentially what we did was we produced a whole lot of uh, lambs uh, and we had the sire sitting at the top but we've also got daughter records that sit out on the farm from the same size. So we've got four years going on five years, so we're almost getting towards the end of a productive life for you, another two more years, and we'll have seven years worth of information around the consumer traits versus uh, the, slaughter, uh, sorry, the daughter records on farm. So it was incredibly important to make sure that that wasn't going to impact from a maternal production point of view uh, with the changes that we were making, putting in this point of difference at the end, genetically, uh, on, the, on the customer side of things. So what came out of that, um, which was uh, music to my ears, um, so fortunately uh, what was revealed from that large undertaking was that uh, the relationship uh, between the traits meant that we could get it right genetically for the animal, but we could also get it right for human health. So this is another graph um, which which demonstrates that we can, there is uh, the ability to make genetic selection and genetic improvement uh, around the omegas. Um, and so that was important for us so that we, because this is the key component to the point of difference for, for the human side of things. So uh, moving on from the genetics, like I said, I couldn't go into everything today, but um, you'd be aware that there's actually a system that follows on from the genetic program with the, which these animals are run through. Um, so one of the key aspects is you can have the best genetics in the world, but unless you can exploit uh, and make sure that you can take that through to the next step, um, so unless we were going to ensure that ad adequate nourishment was available to those animals um, to nutritionally condition themselves prior to slaughter, uh, we could have been between a rock and a hard place and that's one thing that I think everybody needs to take home today is that, and this graph shows it very, very clearly, um, you know, a finishing based system doesn't actually matter. If you've got a high energy forage, it actually remains relatively consistent right through, through, through the year and I've looked at multiple of them. But pasture and grass fed systems, the animals will go into deficit quite regularly. So they actually can't eat enough to get what they require to be able to nutritionally condition themselves. And that is one aspect of our production systems that we just haven't grown to understand until now. So key part of the system is making sure that we're nutritionally conditioning. And, and what that does is it, it sets up the animal to come in and provide a very uh, great quality product that builds the healthy fats in um, because we've got the genetic potential to do that as well as we've got the right nourishment coming through. But it also manages pH. Um, pH is a key component to getting great eating quality and people aren't going to go and buy this product 
uh, for additional value if they're going to get a poor eating experience and that's one thing that can disrupt. So, you know, Alliance uh, and Headwaters and MPI, you know, they've come out with a phenomenal base, which this information is coming out into the media. We're working with Beef and Lamb Genetics um, to get the genetic side of it integrated through from a maternal perspective and intramuscular fat is available as a research BV as a result of this program as well. So, um, you know, fundamentally it's understanding the animal and its relationship with the environment as well as making sure it's got the right genetic package to do that so that you can build that difference into the, the resulting product that we can extract further value for. So traceability and measurement, I mean, you know, um, the wee diagram that the guys put together, if, if we can't trace, trace the product and we can't measure I mean, ultimately, we can't make sure the reward is coming back in the right direction to incentivise, um, but ultimately, we have to make sure that the product is right for human health as well, so we have to be able to measure that online as well. So that, all of that has been developed. Um, oh, sorry, I'll just go back through that. So um, the graph there demonstrates uh, variation in IMF. Um, the, one, the one aspect here is, so this is, this is the number of animals that are going through. Um, this is the one that you need to look at there. Uh, so IMF, uh, we know that, that when, when this product goes through the plant, we know that we are hitting spec in regards to IMF. So this is in animals, not uh, No, that's individual animals. Yep, yep, yep. So the other aspect that, um, you know, I, I talked about getting closer to the market um, this has probably been the best part. I, I haven't really ventured down. Uh, I'd spent time in offshore markets, but this has been probably the most magical spot for us all. So having this direct contact uh, with food service and allowing those relationships to develop with chefs. So when we have our forums, the chefs come down too. And they get to hear exactly what's going on in the production system. They get to hear the raw talk about what, the, what our concerns are. And, and, you know, ultimately, um, and sorry, I'll just point out these pictures. So this is a feedback. Um, this is feedback from, because the product's going into my food bag. You, you may or may not. So anyone who's getting my food bag, um, the product has been going into my food bag. So these are, this is the rating that's been coming back. And believe me, they're very quick to tell you what they don't like. Um, so, you know, immediately when... Uh, when we don't get something right, which we haven't had anything to date, but um, a couple of things the chefs have come back and said, uh, you know, cut size was a little bit variable, uh, that's come back immediately and we can tidy the game up. Um, so, you know, getting that immediate feedback on quality and making sure that they are getting the ultimate eating experience has, has been, A, the magic spot, but also it's just, it's so easy. You, you can turn things around immediately and you know. Um, and you can isolate what the issue is and act on it. And it means that you don't have a disgruntled customer and they're very prepared to come back and they're loyal. So um, this market feedback loop is, de is, is honestly, it's desperately required for the sector and I don't care how niche, um, but even, even on, a, on a larger scale, making sure that we have got that connection through to market is absolutely paramount. So um, to finish up with, you know, these are just kind of core ethos and philosophies that I think we should be working with in the future. So, you know, all partners in the supply chain, you know, we're morally responsible, in my opinion, for making the change. It's not just one person. Um, and we need to make it within uh, the realms of our own businesses, but it has to have a strategy to connect it all up. Um, and I believe that that's what is going to make the difference for all. Uh, and, you know, it's very much a collective approach rather than an individualistic one, so that's what I'd encourage you to take home as well. I think we've operated in silos for way too long now. You know, the, the processes are our friends. They are, they are starting to come around to the fact that the game is changing, and really I would encourage you, uh, you know, if there was one message that I could get you, it, it's this collective approach rather than an individualistic one. So, you know, from what I've learnt uh, over the last 10 years with Omega Lamb, um, you know, the world is absolutely the farming fraternity's oyster. I just I want you to, to think about this, so stop waiting for the solution to arrive. 
It is no one else's responsibility. You know, in the farming system, there's, there's lots that we can do. Uh, and, and so, you know, don't expect it to arrive on your doorstep because it's not. That would be my take on the world. Um, so my advice is to go out there and think about it yourself and develop your own.